Live from Wish TV, this is News 8, your local election headquarters. Live from the Toby Theater at Newfields in Indianapolis, the 2018 Senate debate. Wish TV, your local election headquarters. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, we bring you a debate between the candidates for Indiana Senate. They are incumbent Democratic Senator Joe Donnelly, Republican Mike Braun, and Libertarian Lucy Brenton. Yeah, let's take a live picture right now inside the Toby Theater uh, here at Newfields, just down the way from us from this room. Uh, this will be the second and final of two televised debates between the candidates. Questions for this debate came uh, primarily from the public. The moderator for tonight's debate is Amna Nawaz, an anchor at PBS NewsHour. Let's toss it out to her now, live at the Toby Theater. Good evening, and welcome to the second of two U.S. Senate debates of the Independent Nonpartisan Indiana Debate Commission. We're coming to you live from the Toby Theater at Newfields in Indianapolis. Joining us are the three candidates on the ballot, incumbent Democrat Joe Donnelly, Republican challenger Mike Braun, and Libertarian challenger Lucy Brenton. The winner of this election on November 6th will represent the people of Indiana in a six-year term in Washington. I'm your moderator, Amna Nawaz. I'm the national correspondent and primary substitute anchor for the PBS NewsHour, and I am honored to be here to serve as your moderator of this very important debate. For about the next hour, the candidates will debate a variety of issues. As with the first debate earlier this month, nearly all of the questions came from you, members of the public who submitted questions about what concerns you. Some of them are here to ask their question in person. None of the questions nor the topics have been shared in advance with any candidate. And now, here are your candidates. Next to me is Joe Donnelly, the Democrat incumbent who is completing his first term. He was elected to the Senate in 2012. In the middle is Republican Mike Braun, an auto parts distributor of Jasper in southwest Indiana and a former state representative. He won the Republican primary in May. Also with us is Lucy Brenton, the Libertarian, a finance professional of Indianapolis. She previously ran for the U.S. Senate in 2016. And now the candidates can further introduce themselves and make a one-minute opening statement, starting with Senator Donnelly. Thank you, Amna, and thank you to all the Hoosiers. You know me. I've been, had the privilege of being your senator for the last six years. I was the final vote to save health care. I fought to secure our borders. I fought to protect Social Security and Medicare. And I stood up for our troops and for our veterans. But who is Mike Braun? Mike Braun has a $10,000 deductible for the workers at his company for health care. They have to pay $10,000 out of their pocket before they can get their first aspirin. At the same time, he gave himself $18 million. But he also wants to go after your health care. He supports a lawsuit that would take away your coverage for pre-existing conditions. And he supported a tax cut by Mitch McConnell, $2 trillion in debt, and they're after Social Security and Medicare now. Mike's after your health care and your Social Security and Medicare. That's what this election is about. Next, we'll hear from Mr. Braun. Thank you for hosting the debate, and thank you, Hoosiers, for tuning in. I am Mike Braun, a lifelong Hoosier, job creator, and political outsider. I'm running for Senate because I'm fed up with business as usual in D.C. Career politicians talk a good game, no action. I moved back to my hometown, creating jobs, uh, starting pay uh, way above the national average. I've done things in the real world. That's the difference between me and the senator. Never had a layoff in 37 years. And yes, I tackle uh, big problems like health care, holding premiums flat for 10 years while covering pre existing conditions, no cap on coverage. Just like I've taken care of my employees, I'll take care of Hoosiers. The senator, he takes his order for Chuck Schumer, who's run a negative campaign against me based upon lies and distortions. Because wrong on health care, wrong on immigration, wrong on tax reform, a loud supporter of Hillary Clinton, and voted against Judge Kavanaugh. I'll stand for Hoosiers when you send me to D.C. Thank you. And now over to Mrs. Brenton. Good evening and welcome. My name is Lucy Brenton, and I've got great news. Only seven short days until the attack ads end, and we can get back to Hoosier hysteria, sugar cream pie, and preparing our homes for the holidays for our families. 
I'm just like you. I'm a mom, a businesswoman, and yes, a senatorial candidate. And I'm here to share solutions with you this evening. First, I will uphold and defend the Constitution and fight any politician that tries to take your rights away. I will work to repeal every unconstitutional law. Second, we must have economic stability, and that means lowering taxes and reducing spending. Our children should not have to face the boondoggle spending that the old parties have done that only paid off their big business buddies. And third, your individual rights are at stake. You should have the right to do whatever you want, as long as you don't hurt anyone else or take their stuff. Tomorrow, you should wake up more free than you are today. Thank you. Thank you to the candidates. And now, let's jump into the questions. This first one is a quickie. The Debate Commission frequently hears from voters like retiree Vance Witham Jr. of Arcadia, who wants to know why candidates don't answer the questions asked. In the interest of voters who are watching tonight, I'm going to ask each of you to just answer with a yes or no. Will you pledge to confine your answers to the questions asked tonight? Let's begin here with Senator Donnelly. Sure, I've always answered the questions asked. Mr. Braun? I'll do the same. And Mr. Yes, Johnson. my track record, record proves I'm the only one. On now to the news of the day. This is a question straight from the headlines today. The president said uh, that he plans to end birthright citizenship through executive order. Senator Lindsey Graham has said that he will introduce legislation to support the president's plan. Would you vote to end birthright citizenship? It goes first to Senator Donnelly. Well, I'm the only person on this stage who voted three times for a border wall. I voted against sanctuary cities. <laughs> I've stood for secure borders with John McCain when, in 2013, we passed legislation that would have provided an additional 20,000 border agents to the border. In regards to birthright citizenship, that's the 14th Amendment of our Constitution. And so how this should be handled is by the Congress. And I heard you say that Lindsey Graham is going to put, put legislation forward. We have to take a look at that legislation. As of right now, the 14th Amendment of the Constitution says um, exactly regarding this issue. And so I'd want to see that legislation, make sure it was constitutional, and review it first. Mr. Braun, over to you. So birthright uh, citizenship, all of these issues have accumulated over a long period of time. And I think the key difference this evening is going to be, are you happy with the way results have happened in D.C.? Do you think the people that have been there have fixed these problems? I know Hoosiers rank border security up there with the cost of health care and real worries about whether Social Security and Medicare are going to be there. I think finally we've got a leader in the White House that is doing something about it. You cannot keep kicking these issues down the road. Politicians on both sides of the aisle, and uh, the Senator's been there for a long time. You know, he's made a career out of being in the game. He's got to hold responsibility for it. So he did cover that issue, right? There's going to be legislation on it, and I think we'll see how that pans out. But it's the accumulation of many years of neglect, of neglecting border security. Thank goodness we're finally attending to it. Before we move on, Mr. Braun, very quickly, the question was about legislation about birthright citizenship. Would you support it or not? I will uh, wait and see uh, what the uh, discussion is on it. And if Lindsey Graham is introducing it, I think it will be uh, something I'll take a look at. I'm not going to say whether I support it or not until I read the legislation. Mrs. Brenton, to you. Thank you. Uh, Mike talks about the leader that's in Washington, D.C., but what if your leaders are doing the wrong thing? Should you support them or blindly follow them? I would say no. We do have the 14th Amendment, just like we have other amendments of the Constitution, to make clear what the laws are in our country and what the master contract is. No one is above the law. No one makes unilateral decisions in this country. We, we got rid of King George for a reason, right? Can we at least agree on that? King George is gone. We're not replacing him with King Trump. No one is going to make unilateral decisions in our country. Now, if there's more law that's brought forward, will you even be surprised? What is the politician's answer to everything? We've got to make a law. Part of that's their ego. They want their name on a law. I'm not into that. What I want to know is, is this legislation something that's going to be good for our country, or is it going to violate the Constitution like so many of our laws have? Let's use that as the standard, once again, the Constitution. 
Senator Donnelly, you, should, you said you'd like I, I a rebuttal. You have 30 seconds. Okay. Um, the reason this has been around a long time is it's in the Constitution of the United States. It's the 14th Amendment. It's the guiding document of our nation. I voted three times for border wall security. But here's the thing. This is an issue you have to have bipartisan support for. I've passed 50 pieces of legislation with a Republican partner every single time. And Mike can't even name a single Democrat that he would work with. Moving on now to another question about immigration. Uh, the conversation around immigration has uh, flared up recently, it's fair to say. It's been a pretty divisive topic recently. And a number of voters this year submitted questions on related issues, such as the proposal for a border wall and the protection of dreamers. One of those voters is here with us, Patrice Widener, a retired career coach and IT manager from Carmel. Patrice? What would you do specifically to encourage positive U.S. policy approaches to immigration? The question goes to Mr. Braun first. First of all, we are a country that has welcomed people. We've been based upon immigration. And I think the key is we need a system that's going to have some uh, decorum to it. And when it comes to legal immigration, you know, I uh, think that we need to stress that. There are a lot of uh, places uh, in our economy that need people to come in to fill jobs. But when it comes to border security, I rest the responsibility on the shoulders of politicians that have been there. Until we actually build a wall and secure the border in an absolute way, you're going to have all of these issues keep coming up when it comes to sanctuary cities, when it comes to visa lotteries, all the problems that are associated with it. Finally, we've got leadership. We're attending to it. The senator says he's going to vote with the president. He never votes with him on other things like uh, health care, tax reform, uh, and so forth. So I don't know that you can take that to heart. Mrs. Brenton? Positive policies on U.S. immigration. That's a great question. Thank you for asking it. America has been the melting pot. At least it was in the cartoons that I watched growing up. Maybe you remember those that you could sing along with and learn about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. We're the greatest country in the world because we welcomed the greatest minds in the world to come here and to make a better life. The reason we've got problems right now is because the incentives are skewed, because we're welcoming people in some cases that think that they can come and freeload off of our country. And unfortunately, that casts a bad light on the people that are willing to bring their time and their talents here. They may not have treasure, and that should not keep them out of our country. It shouldn't be like winning the lottery. $5,000 to come into our country might as well be $5 million for someone from a poor country. If they're willing to work, they should be willing to come here and we should be willing to accept them. Senator Donnelly, the question again is what would you specifically do to encourage positive policy? Patrice, thank you very much. Um, I've taken action. I was part of the group that the President asked to put legislation together, and we did. It provided that our DACA children who came here, their parents didn't come here the right way, but they're two or three years old, that they could stay and we would provide funding for the border wall. Like anything, it's a compromise, and it's everybody working together. It was approximately 10 Democrats and 10 Republicans. I was one of the 10 Democrats that worked with the President on this. That legislation was sent to the White House. Later that night, they decided they were no longer for it. The next day, we had 57 votes, and it didn't make it. But in 2013, I stood with John McCain for legislation that provided the opportunity to have 20,000 additional border agents and we worked on getting immigration policy right. 70, over 70 of our Fortune 500 companies were founded by immigrants. Over 25 percent of Nobel laureates are immigrants. We can make this country greater together. Our next question from the live audience comes tonight from Corey Holland, a pharmacist from Indianapolis. Corey. Good evening. My question is, now that the health care mandate has been removed, what specifically will you do to ensure that health care insurance premiums remain affordable for middle and lower income families? The question goes first to Mrs. Brenton. Thank you. It's a good question. How do we keep health care affordable for middle income families? Well, I think the first thing that we can agree on is that government does not work. And when government gets involved with things, it gets more expensive, less efficient, costs go up, care goes down. 
So by removing government and taking government out of the position of being in between the person receiving the care and the person providing the care, we'll be able to remove all the costs of government that are associated with it. Second, there's just a short vignette from my personal life. I've had 10 children. When I had a midwife assisted birth at a hospital with excellent insurance because I worked at the phone company, it was over $14,000 for a non-medicated birth with no OBGYN and not a single aspirin. That same birth at home for a different child was $4,000 with a midwife. You see, when government gets involved and healthcare and gets involved, insurance companies have to make a profit. So we've got to take those levels of administration out of it. Senator Donnelly. Corey, thank you for the question. I was part of a group of senators that put together legislation that's just waiting for a vote right now. Hopefully when we go back, we'll have it that puts in place cost sharing that would re the funds that the ACA produces, it's in the black, go over to the insurance companies, it lowers premiums for everybody. And in addition, it involves reinsurance to lower costs as well, which would significantly lower premiums. But here's what we don't want to do. Mike Braun supports a lawsuit today, today, that would take away pre-existing conditions coverage, that would end the opportunity to not have lifetime caps. So that young person who's on an Indianapolis IPS bus with asthma and their chest is tightening and they need the inhaler, if he has his way, those pre-existing conditions aren't covered anymore. Same for diabetes, same for multiple sclerosis. That's how important this election is. Mr. Braun, you have one Thank minute. Thank you, Corey. Great question. This is, should be the one thing you take away from this debate. There's only one person here that's actually done what you're talking about. It was called the Affordable Care Act, which Joe was all for. It's the Unaffordable Care Act. It was doomed to fail because you had big government get in cahoots with big health care, specifically big health insurance. I took on the health insurance companies 10 years ago. And regardless of what his Democratic talking points are, I would never be for any replacement that doesn't cover pre-existing conditions and doesn't, that, does, that ha, has no cap on coverage. You'll get that out of me, and I did it on my own. Joe blows in the wind on this stuff, and you can't count on him for what you're going to do to actually lower costs. I'm the only one in the real world that does it. You can go to joeblowsinthewind.com and you can get the particulars out of it, and you'll see all my particular solutions on holding health care costs down. Mrs. Thank Brenton, you. you indicated you wanted a response. You have 30 seconds. Yes, thank you. There are already free market solutions in place for health care. Liberty Share, MediShare. There are already organizations that have tackled the, the problem, the Unaffordable Care Act. It really is the Unaffordable Care Act. Because the insurance companies were allowed to write the laws, of course they wrote them for themselves. Of course they hurt the American people when they did it, because they all wanted to line their pockets. And that's what politicians do and have done, and you can't expect anything different. Let the free market decide. You making decisions for your family is the best way to go. Senator Donnelly, you have 30 seconds as well. Well, here's what Mike's no Mike, Mike knows. And what he said is not true. Mike supports a lawsuit that would end the Affordable Care Act, that would end pre-existing conditions. So all of you watching out there tonight, if you have someone in your family with diabetes, with arthritis, with asthma, their coverage goes away if Mike's lawsuit is successful. As I said, that's how important this is. Those are the facts, and he can't deny that. Mr. Brown, I know you wanted a rebuttal. The question again was if you could name a specific thing you would do to keep health premiums low. So, first of all, as a Republican, you get swept into the fact that you would support that lawsuit. That's not the case. The proof is in the pudding. I did it in the real world. We've done things like health savings accounts. We've done telemedicine where you can actually get health care when you're on the road. Transparency, consumer driven. That'll knock the cost down because my policy costs one-fourth of what his Obamacare policy costs. There's no disputing that, and I've done it in the real world. He's crafted something with big health care doomed to fail. All right, we have another question now. 
Moving on to uh, Jill Coyman, who's joining us here, a fundraiser for a local educational institution from Indianapolis. Over to you. Hello. Easily accessible and free or low-cost contraceptives have proven to be an effective way to reduce unintended pregnancies. What is your position on providing low-cost or free contraceptives to reduce abortions by reducing unintended pregnancies? Senator Donnelly, that goes to you first. Um, contraceptive coverage is included in the Affordable Care Act. Um, I voted for the Affordable Care Act. And it helps, as you indicated, uh, to, to make sure that we don't wind up in a situation with an abortion. I am pro-life. I have every single time voted to make sure federal funds couldn't be used for abortion-related services. But I also have exceptions in the case of rape and incest and life of the mom. If your daughter happens to be raped, Mike thinks that the government has a role and a position in the middle of that. I don't. If incest occurs, I don't think it's our business to be part of. And if your wife or daughter gets that terrible news that they may lose their life in a pregnancy, Mike thinks that the government has a role in that. I don't. That's about your family and your prayers. Mr. Braun? So this is another typical case where uh, the senator tries to have it both ways. When it comes to contraceptive coverage, I think everybody's on board with that. But when it comes to the sanctity of life, you cannot say you're pro-life and have your voting record. I'm the one that's being endorsed by the Indiana Right to Life. Susan B. Anthony, that's knocked on 500,000 doors for me. And the National Right to Life is endorsing me. They give Joe an F grade. So I think you've got to be clear about not trying to have it both ways. I would never demonize anybody that disagrees with my point of view. I was raised to respect the sanctity of life, and I'm proud of that. And uh, I'll never disagree or, de or I never demonize anybody that disagreed with me. It's simple as that. Mrs. Brenton. Thank you. I have 10 children. <laughs> So the idea of contraceptives is something that I am very much interested in. Um, <laughs> are there days that I want that to be retroactive if they haven't done the dishes? Probably. Of course contraceptives should be affordable. Of course they should be widely available. Let's make sure that they're safe and effective, and let's make sure that people know how to use them properly. And if you choose to have 10 children, as my husband and I did, and that was our goal, uh, then great. But if that's not the choice that you want to make for your family, then you simply make a different choice. But let's also make sure that there aren't unintended consequences and that there are you know, some sort of common sense rules. I have I have a 14-year-old daughter. If she's seeking contraceptives, I think I have the right as her parent and the responsible party to know about it. So let's make sure that it doesn't become a free-for-all, but that we inject Hoosier common sense and American values into reducing the number of abortions by making contraception widely available and inexpensive. Senator, you indicated you wanted a response? Uh, I do. Uh, I believe in the sanctity of life as well. I believe in the sanctity of all life, and that includes your wife your mom, your daughter. And if your wife gets that terrible news that she will lose her life in this pregnancy, Mike, it is not our business to be in the middle of that. That is your family. I can't think of any reason the government needs to be involved in that decision. That's your family. That's the life of your wife or your daughter. That's the sanctity of all life. Mrs. Brenton, you have 30 seconds. I hear a lot of politicians talking about the sanctity of life. Here's the life that I don't hear them talking about. I don't hear them talking about the children and the wedding parties that we've drone bombed. So sad. I don't hear them talking about the death penalty. You see, the politicians are all pro-death when it plays great on the news. But when it comes to actually protecting life, they're happy to send our sons and daughters into endless foreign wars, like Afghanistan. Do you even know why we're in Afghanistan? It's because there's lithium in the Afghan mountains. You should look at that, and then look at your iPhone and realize there's lithium in that, too. Put two and two together. 
Moving on now to the deficit, our next question comes from Horace Tucker, a retiree in Columbus, who wants to know your plans to balance the federal budget. More specifically, would you support increasing revenue as through raising taxes or cutting spending as through defense or entitlements? Mr. Brown, the question goes to you first. Well, this is another defining issue. When it comes to the federal government and the career politicians that have been there as a steward, why would you want to send someone back there that's been there 12 years and we now have $22 trillion in debt and running near, nearly uh, tw uh, trillion dollar deficits? It doesn't make sense. In the real world, what you would do is it's not a revenue problem, it's a spending problem. And we've not lived within our means for years. You would, uh, Rand Paul uh, has a bill where it's called the penny plan, 1%. Who would know if you're missing that? Uh, president just asked all agencies to cut back 5%. Any business, you would do it. You know, the Senator's been part of a system that has given us all these bad results. And the other thing I do, anybody that's been there does not deserve a congressional pension or a fancy health care plan. They ought to be on the same thing that everybody else is. And that's where you'd start. Mrs. Brenton. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Reduce spending, lower taxes, increase revenue. What does all of this mean in the context of the last 150 years of Republican and Democrat domination in our society? It doesn't mean anything because they talk about this, but then as soon as they get elected, it doesn't matter whether they're in a red shirt or a blue shirt, they still vote to raise your taxes and they don't reduce spending. Do you want to actually hack at the roots of evil? Then you've got to end the biggest part of our budget, which is just going out the window, and that's interest on the federal debt. End the Federal Reserve. We must abolish the Federal Reserve and repudiate the debt repudiate the interest that we are paying on money that they create out of thin air. It's a complex issue, but here's what you have to know. It doesn't matter how much we reduce our spending. It doesn't matter how much we increase revenue if we're paying interest to a group of bankers that have controlled our country since 1913. Senator Donnelly. Thank you very much. As you look at this, what's happened is Mitch McConnell just had a huge tax cut. He gave all the money to his richest friends. Mike walked away with a wheelbarrow full of cash that could have been used to shore up Social Security and could have been used for Medicare. That just increased our deficit by over $2 trillion. We couldn't afford Mitch McConnell's tax cut for the very, very wealthiest. $37 went to the very wealthiest for every $1 that went to regular families. I'll fight for regular families. I'll protect Social Security and Medicare. And we do it by making sure we grow our GDP that grows up to a point where it meets spending, which has kept very, very tight is what we do. And when the two meet, approximately 20 percent of GDP and approximately 20 percent of GDP on revenues and expenses, that's where we had our last uh, budget surplus. That's about the neighborhood it happens in but we can't have tax cuts that only help the wealthiest. Thank you. Mrs. Brenton, you have 30 seconds to respond. Yes. Uh, let's talk about how much federal debt there is out there that we're not talking about, about the unfunded liabilities, about the yoke that has been put of economic slavery on every single one of our children, born and not yet born, if they're lucky enough to get born. Which of you would give up your favorite federal program if it meant that you could abolish the federal income tax. I've got a list of them that I would give up. But this is what it boils down to. You can take every asset in this country and you can give it over to the Federal Reserve and it still won't pay off the debt. Take our country back and end the Fed. Mr. Brown, your response? This was the, an issue the Democrats gambled on. They thought tax reform was going to be a class divider. All I know is in my own business, when tax reform passed in December, we lowered family health care benefits by 1400 bucks a year. And remember, that was after holding them flat for 10 years. We gave company bonuses. We enhanced 401k pay. This is the hottest economy we've had in years. Under the Obama regime, 1.5%. Uh, unemployment never got to where it is. That's a failed policy. Let's give something a new chance to work. And I'm, I'm glad we're a part of it, and we've shared the benefits with our employees. 
Senator. Since I've been Senator, we've had 70 consecutive months of job growth. That's every single month. And the truth about your health care plan, Mike, is your employees have to pay $10,000 out of their own pocket before they can get their first prescription. That's not health care. That is, that is something completely different. We stand to make sure that we have the opportunity to get to a balanced budget by being smart on spending and on revenues. Mr. Braun, you indicated you'd like a response as well. This is your second one, so keep it to 15 yes. seconds if you can, please. This is what happens when you have to be briefed on this stuff and you haven't lived it in the real world. What the senator fails to mention is that the premium cost is the only thing that's for certain. My premium cost is 70 bucks a month. His Obamacare plan, the reason it's going broke, is four to five times that much. And my employees get into their deductible far less than you would on an Obamacare plan because we've got incentives to lower costs. That's a failed system that's falling apart. Mine's worked in the real world. Mrs. Brenton, you have 15 seconds as well. Everything that they've just said is smoke and mirrors. They're trying to distract you from the real problem. We're talking about what we're going to do to balance the budget. Money in is money out. And if money out is going to a corporation that has been taking interest on our money and our hard work for our lives all the way back to 1913, you've got to hack at the evil and stop it. Senator Donnelly, 15 seconds for you as well. Mike never denies that it's $10,000 before your first aspirin. Think of that if you're making 25K or 30K uh, at the shop there. How do you ever, ever get there? And additionally, on top of that, what we're trying to do is, as I mentioned, set, oh, I've been told to stop. That was Thank 15 you. seconds. We're moving on now to our next topic, foreign policy. President Trump has made the alliance with Saudi Arabia a cornerstone of his foreign policy. He stood by the leadership even after U.S. intelligence concluded they were directly involved in the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. He's also failed to condemn the Saudi-led bombing in Yemen, where more than 16,000 civilians have been killed. Do you support the president's stance? The question goes to Mrs. Brenton first. Why are we still playing footsie with regimes that murder? What's really at stake here is how do we end our dependence on foreign oil? When we have more oil in Alaska, allegedly, than they have in Saudi Arabia, why are we not mining it? Why are we not drilling for that oil? Why are we continually allowing our country's economy to be dependent on a foreign power and staying in their good graces? Let's end our dependence on foreign oil. And it's not just about solar, although that's part of it. It's not just about wind. I'm not a fan. But it's also about hemp. It's about biodiesel. It's about alternative forms of energy. And in order to make this happen, we've got to get government out of this. As soon as government gets involved in something, it slows down, it gets more expensive, and it requires your tax dollars, first stolen from you, to fund something that they think is a good idea for their big business buddies. Before we move on, just to follow up, your answer then is no, you do not support the president's stance? That is correct. I do not support President Trump supporting the Saudis. Senator Donnelly, to you. Thank you, Amna. Um, as soon as we found out about this, we tried to get more details. Um, I read the classified materials on this. Um, we have contacted the White House about this to get more information. And, and here's what's clear. The Saudis murdered a journalist, Jamal Khashoggi, who's simply trying to make sure that word can get out as to what's going on. He's an Indiana State graduate. He's a sycamore. He lived in Virginia, and they murdered him. I have said that we should have a temporary halt to arms sales to Saudi Arabia until we find out exactly what happened. But Lucy's point is right. We need to stand for ethanol, for E15. The President just signed an executive order. That was my legislation. We worked together on that to get that done. We need to do clean coal ethanol, fight for our farmers, because when money stays here instead of the Middle East, it not only helps our economy, it helps our national security. Mr. Braun. So when it comes to what happened in Saudi Arabia, horrific. And I think the president was out front early that he was going to get to the bottom of it, and you need to. I mean, that is behavior that can't be tolerated. When it comes to foreign policy in general, do you like the new dynamic? 
I think we've seen something that's different. With the senator and the Obama administration, we weren't respected across the world. In uh, North Korea, there's a discussion going on. In Iran, I mean, the senator was for the Iran deal. $150 billion worth of uh, concessions, $1.5 billion in cash delivered to him. We now have regained respect in the world because it's based upon strength, and if you draw a red line, you stick with it. And I think the president has changed the dynamic there to where we're going to see a lot of these problems fixed because of leadership. Before we move on, then the answer to your question is yes, you do support the president's stance? I do support his leadership and uh, the way he'll handle the Saudis, I think, will be to hold them accountable for the horrific act that was created, and he'll take the, the big picture uh, into uh, consideration while he's doing it. Mrs. Brenton, you indicated you'd like a response. Yeah, I see the partisanship in the answers here. You know, I've got to agree with Senator Donnelly. We've got to fight for our farmers, and more choices are better than less choices. And that's why I was talking with somebody from the hemp industry today. And what I found out is that there are businesses in Indiana right now that are importing a one single business in Elkhart is importing 100,000 pounds of hemp fiber to make their products every single week. Why are they not walking across the street and writing the check to a Hoosier farmer? Senator Donnelly, 30 seconds. The question was about Saudi Arabia, but Mike brought up Iran. So here, here's the facts about the Iran uh, deal that was made. Iran was one month away from a nuclear weapon. That created an incredible danger for the Middle East, and we would have had to be involved in the middle of a war. I'll fight for our country every time, but war should be the last option, not the first. They're now 10 years away from a nuclear weapon, and our sons and daughters from Terre Haute and Muncie and Richmond and Evansville will not have to go to war in Tehran to keep our country safe. Very quickly before we move on, Mr. Braun, you wanted a response. You have 15 seconds. Yes. I think this is an issue about leadership and if you're happy with the old dynamic. What we had leading up to this point were problems across the world laid on our doorstep. If you were happy with that, uh, the brinksmanship that it uh, created, fine. I think the president has uh, had a strong case for fixing those things, including having our allies be accountable for their fair share of defense, which no one ever mentioned before. We have a lot of topics to cover, so I do want to move on now to domestic matters. We have another question from the audience. We're joined by Emily Weikert Bryant, an attorney in Indianapolis and executive director of the state's Food Bank Association, Feeding Indiana's Hungry. Emily? Thank you. There are nearly one million Hoosiers who are at risk of hunger and may not know from where their next meal will come. More than 600,000 residents, roughly 10 percent, rely on the federal SNAP benefit. Nearly half of all of Indiana's students receive free and reduced lunches. If elected, what will you do to alleviate hunger in Indiana and to support anti-hunger programs? Senator Donnelly? Thank you for the question. I serve on the Agriculture Committee. I've been part of writing the Farm Bill, and we are very, very close to having it concluded. And in the Farm Bill is not only great provisions for our farmers, making sure that they have crop insurance, making sure that we have good conservation practices, but also that we have good nutrition programs. Nutrition programs that make it so that they're run responsibly, that um, they encourage people to work, and that they fill the need. I've been to our schools to see the nutrition programs in action. I've seen our families as well. It's a critical part of what we do in creating a farm bill. Um, I've been part of that from the start. As I said, we're close to getting this completed, and we should be able to meet in our farm bill that we're putting together right now the nutrition needs of our families. Mr. Braun? Any case of someone going hungry in this state or this country is sad with the plenty that we have here. I think a lot of it has had to do with government. Uh, if I were really wanting to fix the issues uh, associated with hunger, I don't think I'd look to the federal government as much as uh, somebody like the senator would or folks that have been there. Those policies have not worked the way they should. We've got to make sure that we fix these plans to where they work better for the people that need it. And I would trust what we do here in the state more than what I'd throw onto a federal government that's running trillion-dollar deficits. Why would you expect 
a government that's been dysfunctional when it comes to solving hunger issues, solving anything that's been so lacking results. The senator's been part of it, and until you send people there that think out of the box, that have done things in the real world, I don't think you're going to ever be satisfied with actually taking care of something like hunger, which is such a big deal if you're relying on the federal government to do it. Mrs. Brenton, over to you. Thank you for feeding Indiana's hungry. I feed a lot of hungry people, too. I'm a mom of 10 kids. I know what it's like to have to budget and to think about what each meal is going to cost and can I stretch those food dollars for the whole month. It's horrifying to think that anyone in this country should go hungry for even a single meal. We're the best country in the world. We're the land of plenty. We have lots of resources. So if we have a lot of resources and they're not getting to the right people, what's the problem that we really need to fix? Well, let's look at farm bills. Let's look at nutrition. Um, who here knows that you can go and use SNAP benefits and you can buy things with high fructose corn syrup. You can buy soda pop. What is that? That's not something to help people and feed them. It's a gift to Coca-Cola. It's a gift to big businesses to allow funds that should be set aside for real nutrition and real food to just go down the drain with Doritos and soda pop. Stop that. Senator Donnelly, you wanted a response? I do. I, I almost can't believe my ears when I hear you say, what role does the federal government have in nutrition programs? Mike, you should see the faces of the seven-year-old kids who come to school hungry. You, you laugh about it. It is not funny. We have seven-year-old children who come to school hungry, and the meal they get is at school. Those children are not responsible for the bad choices that their parents might make. They need to have a full stomach. They need to have the same chances as every other child in Indiana. Mr. Braun, you wanted to respond. My point is about the effectiveness of what these programs are doing. And there's no disputing that we need to solve hunger wherever it occurs in this country. But if you want career politicians and bureaucrats to keep controlling the show, send him back to Washington. If you want folks that have done things in the real world that make things not only effective but efficient because they don't break the bank, you've got to change the dynamic. We've been doing this thing for years. We need to get entrepreneurs, folks that have done it in the real world, not career politicians. Mrs. Brenton, you wanted to respond? You have 30 seconds. Yeah, absolutely. About doing things in the real world. I've done that in my home. I've done that with a budget. I've invited other children over to our home to eat. Here's what it really boils down to, and I've got to admit, Mike's a little bit part right in this. Don't quote me. But here's the thing. It should be a state's rights issue. It's up to the states to feed its own people. The bigger we grow federal government, the bigger the bureaucracy gets, the more expensive it gets, the further away it gets from the people that it helps. Let Indiana feed Hoosiers. We can do it together. Senator, you, this is your second response, so 15 Nutri seconds, please. Keep it brief. We were able to pass the nutrition program in the Senate, 8611. Incredible number of Republicans as well, because here's what they knew, and here's what they know. A seven-year-old child doesn't know the difference between state rights and federal rights. They just know they're hungry. Let's move on now to a question a lot of people are talking about in the country, that is sexual assault. We have a question from Jenna Childress, a student in Bloomington, and she asks, in the wake of Brett Kavanaugh confirmation and the Me Too movement, how will you fight to protect the rights of sexual assault survivors? More specifically, what can you say to the women out there one out of every three of whom will experience some kind of physical or sexual assault in their lives in this country. What can you say to them to encourage them to come forward? Mr. Brown, the question goes to you first. When it comes to sexual assault or sexual harassment, there is no place for that period in our society. And as we've seen over the last few years, it's been there. And thank goodness it's being flushed out. Uh, I've got daughters, and I've got uh, women that work for my business, would never tolerate that stuff. So I think whenever there is an alleged issue, it needs to be fully vetted. And I think there needs to be a process to do it, but there cannot be any tolerance for sexual harassment in this day and age. And I am glad it's come to the forefront and that we're finally addressing it. Mrs. Breton. I'm one out of three. I'm a woman. And I had my Me Too moment. 
It's up to us to raise good people. It's up to us to create a culture where victims, male and female, can come forward and be believed. It's up to us to remove the shame and the stigma. Society is sending the message to these victims that it's not okay to have been assaulted. And until we deal with that problem, that cultural problem, we're gonna to continue to have people that are too ashamed to come forward. We've got another correlating problem, and that's allocation of resources. Thousands of rape kits sit untested while people who are nonviolent are in jail for drug crimes. That's got to stop. Society must say enough is enough. We're going to make sure that these rape kits are made a priority so that other people can be protected and put the right people in jail, the violent and the assaulting, not the nonviolent. Senator Donnelly. Yeah, I, I don't want to misquote you, Mike, but I thought I heard you say that this issue has been dealt with. The women of Indiana, I don't think, would agree that this issue has been dealt with. There is sexual assault and there is sexual harassment and we need to fully enforce the law at every single turn. We need to put all the effort we can behind this to make sure that our sisters and our daughters and our wives and our moms and sexual harassment also can affect uh, males as well, that we make sure we make our state a safe place at every turn. Mr. Brown, you'd like to respond? Well, you clearly did misquote me. I said uh, unequivocally that it can't be tolerated at any point, whether it's in the business place, whether it's in government, anywhere. And any of us that have daughters would know that that's the case. So uh, that's my statement on it. Very quickly, Mr. Donnelly. I don't think I did, and you can check the record, but I'm glad to see that we agree that this can't be tolerated in any way, shape, or form. We're moving on now to another topic. That is the topic of diversity. The next question comes from the Debate Commission. If elected, how will you commit to bringing diversity into your leadership and senior staffing, including women, African Americans, and other underrepresented groups? The question goes first to Mrs. Brenton. It's a really interesting question to ask of a libertarian because I don't see color. I don't see the differences in people that are shallow. I want to quote Martin Luther King because he said he's more interested in the content of your character. People of color don't want to be given some sort of bone because of the color of their skin. They want to earn the right to be there just like anyone would. There is no way that we should be making value-based decisions simply based on someone's exterior appearance. Haven't we moved past that as a culture? Can't we see what's inside someone? Can't we look at what are their skills and are they appropriate? Let's not look at a bar graph to decide if we have the right number of this or the right number of that. Let's look at the people and the individuals themselves. Senator. We want everybody to have a chance in Indiana and in America. And my offices reflect that, both on the campaign side and on the Senate side. Our state director is Indian American, but he does an amazing job. Our director of all constituent services, she's African American, but she does an even more incredible job than you could ever imagine. It isn't their race or their religion it's the incredible person that they are. But at the same time, they have to have a chance. They have to have an opportunity. And that's my responsibility. And I've done it in every office I've had. And I've done it in every campaign I've had. Because my campaigns and our Senate office should reflect the face of Indiana. Mr. Brown, your minute starts now. I mean, I, I think Lucy hit it on the head there in the sense that equal opportunity, make sure there's never any discrimination. And, you know, you base things upon merit, and it should be colorblind. I know in my own business, built it over 37 years, uh, would never tolerate anything where there wouldn't be complete 
opportunity. When you come there, you work hard, you're able to advance. And always be on guard against discrimination and stuff like that. So I think when it comes to diversity, it should be a natural thing. And if you're inviting and open, and I've done that in my entire life since I moved back to my hometown, started with 15 employees for 17 years, built it into 900 across the country, have always had the policy of anybody that can come to work there, created jobs year after year, and it's been a place of opportunity and would never tolerate any discrimination or any of that stuff along the way. Uh, another question now from the voters. Several voters indicated last time that they weren't satisfied with your answers to a question about climate change in the first debate. So the Commission would like to give you another chance tonight. This is a question from Carolyn Nellis of Evansville who asks this, what will you do, what specifically will you do to combat climate change if I were to vote for you in November? And that question goes to Senator Donnelly first. Well, I've worked really closely with our utilities for a very long time to reduce our carbon footprint in Indiana. And when we do that, it helps reduce greenhouse gases. And that makes sure that we can help to reduce the temperature of the planet and help to reduce climate change. We have to work continuously on this. That's why I'm so in favor of ethanol, E15. Our farmers grow right here in Indiana, maybe one of the very, very finest energy sources, one of the cleanest energy sources that we could possibly have. We have wind and solar. And when we do this, it also helps us clean up our lakes, like Lake Michigan and the Ohio River. So what we are working on every day on climate change is to make it cleaner, to make it American like ethanol, and to make sure we're standing up for our farmers and growing our economy. Mr. Brown, a specific thing you would do, please. When it comes to Mother Earth, I've been a steward of the land since I moved back to my hometown. Uh, we've got to have clean air, we've got to have clean water, and we got to take care of Mother Earth. The big thing I've done over the years is, again, I've lived it. So often, I think when you go to Washington, and not only the senator, others as well, they lose sight of what really works. I've been a tree farmer since I moved back to my hometown back in the late 80s. You know, I've been somebody there that is a conservationist. I think our own party, you know, if you're a conservative, I think you ought to be a conservationist. And I'll always be attentive to it, and I'm going to know the things you can do because I've done it for all the years I've been back in my hometown. And I think that's a key difference you need to pay attention to in terms of the difference between people that have lived things in the real world versus folks that have made a career out of politics. And I'll always have the interest of what's good for Mother Earth in mind because I've lived it that way. Just to follow up real quick, Mr. Braun, is there a specific thing that you might do, a specific step you'd like to name? I think you need to do stuff like uh, promoting, uh, you know, I do it on my own uh, when it comes to being a tree farmer, when it comes to energy, which is the thing I think you're getting at. We need to be energy independent. And in the long run, if we do things right, it'll be the cleanest fuel that's the least expensive that's going to rule the energy world. And when we get that right, we're going to uh, make sure we take care of Mother Earth along the way. Mrs. Brenton, to you. Thank you. I feel like this question was directed at me so that all of you that have your Senate debate bingo cards out can write down hemp again. And maybe you'll get bingo this time. And if not, unicorns, alligators, and Chuck Schumer's puppet. So I hope you filled in some squares there. Global effort to clean the oceans. We are killing Mother Earth. We are, we're just decimating her. Talked about this last time, clean oceans, seeding the photoplankton with heme iron, fixing carbon, this is where hemp comes in, this is where biodiesel comes in, this is where we have to talk about ethanol needing 128% input to get 100% output. It's not the miracle fuel from corn. I mean, the fact of the matter is you can mash up corn or hops or a lot of different things and make alcohol and run a vehicle on it, but is it really the best thing for the environment? Hemp will fix carbon, that takes care of the carbon problem. Hemp can be used for biodiesel. Hempcrete, gosh, just Google it. You guys all got Google, right? Oh, and by the way, it gives farmers more choices than just corn, because after all, there is more than corn in Indiana. We're moving on now. It's time for the final question of the evening. Uh, I'm afraid we have to move on, Senator. This too comes from a Hoosier voter. Brad Carpenter, a chemist in Fishers, asks this. 
If you are elected, what single issue would you make your top priority to address or to fix during your time in office? Each of you will have 30 seconds to answer, no time for rebuttals. And I believe this first question goes to Senator Donnelly. Ending the opioid scourge so that every Hoosier can make it home to their mom and dad. Every Hoosier can come home to their husband and wife. I just had legislation passed just this past week that President Trump signed that will provide us with advanced FDA approval to end the opioid scourge. It will make it so that Eli Lilly that's working on a non-addictive painkiller can get advanced FDA approval to take the place of opioids. That's leadership. That's standing up for our families. Mr. Brown. Okay. When I started off, the big difference here this evening is going to be you're going to get a, like, a guy like me that's done it in the real world. The first thing I'll do there is just what I did when I got to the State House. I want to lower the cost of health care to where it is affordable what the original bill was supposed to do. You're not going to get it out of people that have been there and actually were for a plan that had big health care with big government. I've done it in the real world, covered pre existing conditions no cap on coverage, held premiums flat for 10 years, and lowered family costs 1400 bucks a year. I'll take that to the Senate, and you'll see real results. Mrs. Brenton. Boy, after all of that, I've forgotten the question. Would you mind repeating it? Not at all. We're asking what your single issue would be as your top priority to address or fix once in office. Thank you. The top priority is and always will be reducing the size of the federal government, putting a muzzle on it, and making the federal government stay to the simple Constitution. The reason we have all this craziness, the reason that there are favors to hand out and billions of dollars to hand out to big businesses is because the size of the federal government has grown. And you know, I, I saw an ad with Senator Donnelly chopping up some wood, and it reminded me of this. The forest dwindled, and yet the trees voted for the ax because its handle was made of wood, and they thought it was one of them. Candidates, thank you for being here again to share your views on these very important issues. We also want to thank our audience in this room and all of you for watching or for listening. We want to give special recognition and appreciation to television station WFYI in Indianapolis for producing this program and to its retiring president, Lloyd Wright, for his continued support of the debate commission over the years. We will miss him. This debate was brought to you partly thanks to underwriting from the Indy Chamber and the AARP, and we thank them for their support, too. We also thank the League of Women Voters for keeping the time clock for the candidates. And last but not least, be sure to vote for the candidate of your choice on November 6th. I'm Amma Nawaz of PBS NewsHour. Thank you.